Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, you know I am Michael Rooks, Wheeland Family Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the High Museum, and uh, I appreciate you all coming out tonight for our talk by Curator Diana Tweet in conjunction with the exhibition Bob Thompson, This House is Mine, which is uh, an exhibition organized by the Colby Museum, uh, or the Colby College Museum of Art, excuse me, and of course curated by Diana Tweet. Um, there are two really cool titles in the land of curators. Um, one is in Hawaii, and if any of you remember Hawaii Five-0, Jack Lord was McGarrett, and there's the Jack Lord curator at the Hawaii Museum of Art. And then there is the Alex Katz curator at Colby College Museum of Art, and that's what uh, Diane's, Diane's uh, former title was when she was curating this exhibition. So I, I'm a bit envious of that, of that title but thank you. Um, the exhibition has been sponsored by our premier exhibition sponsor, Delta Airlines, um, and our premier supporters, ACT Foundation, Sarah and James Kennedy, Louise Sams and Jerome Griot, with the estate of Dr. John H. Weens, Harry Norman Realtors, and the Wish Foundation, as well as our benefactor supporters, Robin and Hilton Howell, and the High Museum's ambassador and contributing exhibition series supporters. And Again, thank you all, especially if you're members of the museum, for coming out tonight. So uh, I mentioned Diana Tweet, the curator of the exhibition. Diana is currently a visiting senior curator of modern and contemporary art at the Stanley Museum of Art at University of Iowa, uh, a museum that has one of the best collections of American post-war art you'll find anywhere in the country. As Katz curator at Colby College Museum of Art, uh, Diana uh, organized the nationally touring exhibition, Bob Thompson's House is Mine, as well as uh, a phenomenally wonderful Alex Katz exhibition uh, and many other projects. Recent projects include uh, Jacob Lawrence, The Life of Toussaint Louverture, uh, Torquese Dyson, Nautical Dusk, and Leah Modigliani, How Long Can We Tolerate This? She's also lectured and published widely on subjects ranging from Edward Hopper's critically re uh, critical reception to inauthenticity in the work of uh, Hugh Locke. Uh, Hugh Locke, who is the son of Donald Locke, uh, a late artist who we like to claim here as an Atlanta artist, for those of you who don't know uh, that Hugh and Donald Locke are related. In her curatorial practice, uh, Diana has committed to bringing visibility to under-examine histories and creating space for multidisciplinary uh, knowledge and non-traditional expertise to contribute to social justice-informed research and interpretation. She belongs to the Advisory Circle for Indigo Arts Alliance, which is an organization committed to cultivating the artistic development of people of African descent. So with that, uh, please help me welcome Diana Tweet. Thank you, Michael. And thank you all for being here tonight. At least there's air conditioning for us. I'm very grateful to be here, and I want to start by thanking Rand, Michael, Danielle, Erin, Marcy, Yadira, and everyone on the team here for this kind invitation. Congratulations on a beautiful exhibition for those who haven't seen it. Many of us in the field look to your institution as a guide. We admire and emulate your work, so we're thrilled to bring this exhibition to the high. I also want to acknowledge our presence in the homelands of the Muscogee Creek and Cherokee peoples who were subject to involuntary removal from these territories. Bob Thompson, This House is Mine, owes a tremendous debt to Sharon Corwin, the former Carolyn Muzzy director at the Colby College Museum of Art, who believed that the show needed to reach as many audiences as possible. The project benefits from the gracious support of Jackie Terrassa, her successor, who's here this evening, and the tireless work of Lorraine Delaney, Registrar for Exhibitions and Loans, and Megan Carey, Senior Manager of Publications and Exhibitions. Thanks to the philanthropy of Alex Katz, Colby is fortunate to count five works by Bob Thompson among its holdings. I want to express our gratitude to the many other lenders, some of whom parted with works of art 
friends, really, that they have lived with since the 1960s. Thank you to the Michael Rosenfeld Gallery, which represents the Bob Thompson Estate, and the Andy Warhol Foundation, which generously supported our vision. And did anyone make it in to see the show already? A few of you, okay, wonderful. I was told I'm not allowed to move the mic, but I can move closer, I'm a, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> Looming dark animals, spread-eagled bats, devils, ghosts, apparitions, falling or flying women, appear in great variety of imaginative distortion of body and features in scenes that are grim or prophetic looking, even while they spring with erotic pleasure or pure color. So reads one 1964 Art News summation of Bob Thompson's work. It's an appropriately unwieldy attempt to capture all of that. Bob Thompson, This House is Mine, offers us the opportunity to meet or perhaps reacquaint ourselves with this American artist who died at the age of 28 in 1966. I was insufficiently daunted by the prospect of focusing on someone whose career lasted only eight years. Bob Thompson created art with urgency. He painted on scraps of mail, chair backs, salvaged drawer fronts, boxes of matches. The smallest painting I've seen is about two postage stamps in size and the largest garden of music you'll see in the show. The first Thompson retrospective, organized by Thelma Golden and Judith Wilson at the Whitney Museum of American Art in 1998, showcased 120 objects and reconstructed a nearly lost biography. Despite the seismic waves it generated, Thompson has remained external to many histories of American art and international modernism, and until recently has often been relegated to museum storage. But artists never forgot him and his riotous color his synthesis of citations can sometimes be explicit, but elsewhere masked and layered. Everyone finds something different in his work. Degas riders on horseback, Munch's absinthian greens, German expressionism spiritual fever dreams, Manet's Olympia and her underconsidered maid. We see them here, and there was a reproduction of this painting tacked to his studio wall that you can see in one of the images in the catalog. Robert Colescott, a contemporary of Thompson's, described his work as having the power to make you laugh and cry. Indeed, he achieves an exquisite density of effects. What I'll do tonight is offer a brief overview that brings in a few things beyond the scope of the show, and you know, before I do so, I want to just turn to the painting from which the show takes its name. Many, many, many times larger here. This House is Mine is the title of a modest 7 by 12 inch painting on board from 1960. It belongs to the collection of an artist acquaintance of his. This house is mine includes many compositional elements that start to solidify in 1960 and 61. He constructs a landscape from smoldering pools of color, punctuated by trees that serve as internal frames. Thompson drags and hooks the paint around forms to push them into relief or to coax them to recede, generating instability from overlapping the figure and the horse at right, for example, or alighting the edges of a silhouette set against a gaping road. It's a painting that condenses many of his genericized tropes. More significantly, this title is the only one I've found to be so assertively 
self-referential. There's one other painting, and on the back is a partial inscription that tapers off but begins, come into my. <laughs> That's the only other sort of mention uh, of him in a title. This house is mine. Such a declaration speaks to an intention to take possession of a representational syntax to make himself a black American at home within the exclusionary space of canonical European painting when doing so was particularly unfashionable. It's a pronouncement of ownership consistent with the sentiments of the American writer James Baldwin, who also sought refuge in Europe. In his 1964 essay, Why I Stopped Hating Shakespeare, Baldwin wrote, my quarrel with the English language has been that the language reflected none of my experience. Perhaps the language was not my own because I had never attempted to use it, had only learned to imitate it. If this were so, then it might be made to bear the burden of my experience, if I could find the stamina to challenge it and me to such a test. Like Baldwin, Thompson found ways to use painting, to challenge its alleged universality by forcing it to encompass other historical subjectivities. He created images that were highly personal, but not explicitly self-referential. One reviewer in 1969 referred to them as his private mythological subjects, familiar but unavailable. And I'm just, this is just kind of a bonus that I'm showing you the back of a painting um, because less so here, but he can often be quite chatty on the backs of um, the work, making notes about when and where, what month, what year, what city things were painted in. Sometimes we'll find a few titles that he might have rejected and crossed out. Um, this one's pretty straightforward, however. So who was Bob Thompson? Robert Lewis, Bob Thompson, was born into a middle-class black family in Louisville, Kentucky. He was the youngest of Cecil DeWitt Thompson and Bessie Thompson's three children. When he was an infant, the family moved from Louisville to Elizabethtown. There his mother worked as a teacher and his father operated a dry cleaning business until he was tragically killed in an automobile accident in 1950 when Bob was 13. He was always interested in art. According to his brother-in-law, Bob would take down the window shades and paint on them. After his father's death, the adolescent lived with his sister and her husband in Louisville, where he attended Central High School. He was a student there when the 1954 Supreme Court ruling in Brown versus Board of Education deemed school segregation unconstitutional. Between 1955 and 1956, he briefly studied medicine at Boston University. One of his sisters was living in Cambridge and his mother urged him, like many, <laughs> to try to become a doctor, but it didn't take. He returned to Kentucky and enrolled in the studio program at the University of Louisville. In the summer of 1958, two of his university instructors encouraged him to go to Provincetown to continue his training. By 1916, the Boston Globe had pronounced Provincetown the biggest art colony in the world and little changed in the intervening decades. A friend of Thompson's recalled that he rented a cabin from the only other black man then living in Provincetown as a full-fledged property owner. Provincetown was home to Hans Hoffman's summer school, which had been operative since 1935. And a former student of Hoffman's a printmaker associated with New York's Atelier 17, Song Moy promoted himself as the new kid on the block when he opened 
his studio in the mid-1950s. And this is a page from one of uh, Bob Thompson's sketchbooks, sort of leading up to that time in Provincetown. I think it's easy to see how his calligraphic sensibility and Sung Moy's were sympathetic for a moment. According to Thompson, it was a summer he spent looking at reproductions of work by Ang, Delacroix, and Matisse. He paints the chase this summer and later gifted it to his former Louisville teacher, Ulfert Vilke. Already in evidence is his commitment to a representational style that is not reliant upon the detail, something he saw as his foremost challenge. This blocky individual applies both hands to the wings of a vigorously painted bird. It's an atmospherically subdued composition in terms of the palette, and Thompson reserves sinewy color for the outstretched arms and hand to accentuate this gesture and these points of contact. How delicate, how wrenching. Has the bird been caught, or is it about to be set free? And it's worth noting how early and continually the bird appears as a cipher in Thompson's work. Here, at least, it seems to read as a metaphor for his artistic pursuits. Does that sound okay for everyone? Okay, just checking. In addition to introducing him to many of the artists with whom he would become close, 1958 represented a brush with another influence. Like several of his instructors at the University of Louisville, Jan Müller was a German emigre. He spent summers in Provincetown, where, beginning in 1953, he abandoned the pure abstraction of Hans Hoffmann, with whom he had studied, to cultivate a strain of figurative expressionism. Müller embraced mythological and folkloric narrative cycles into which he could project the horrors of European fascism. Scenes featured tense encounters between figures with masked aspects, prone and on horseback. And just Miller sort of um, backstory, since I had originally thought about um, a show in which both artists might feature. With the rise of the National Socialists, Müller's family had fled Germany in the 1930s, and he contracted rheumatic fever, made worse by his internment in France. The illness weakened Müller's heart enough that he had a valve surgically implanted in 1953, and this ultimately led to his death in January 1958 at the age of 35. Thompson encountered Müller's work that summer when he arrived in Provincetown, but the two men never met. He became acquainted with the artist's widow, Dodi, and painted this funeral scene from his imagination. The dolorous composition organizes itself around a void above which a slab levitates. The frieze-like composition is a classical lamentation. Thompson grieves the artist's premature death and their failure to connect before he passed. He was not at the funeral, of course, so this is a poetic misrepresentation of history that exemplifies the license he took with inherited forms, influences, and assumptions. It's something of an anomaly for the way that it commemorates a personal contemporary event. Nevertheless, one can see it as embodying many of the abiding concerns of the next few years of his career. Somatic danger, ritualistic collectivity, bearing witness, and intimacy all coalesce here as mourning. And this is a work that I only learned of after organizing the show 
So I have to find ways to squeeze it in because I would have liked to include it. <laughs> but um, Thompson made his first sales in 1958 when Walter Chrysler purchased 13 works, all of the works that he showed at the Provincetown Art Festival. So one can see how it wasn't long before he withdrew from the University of Louisville and settled in New York in 1959. And it's at this point that we really see him drifting towards the rhapsodic palettes for which he becomes known and toying with historically devotional image formats. This is quite a large triptych. It is a triptych, of course, being a three-paneled painting often used for Christian altars beginning in the Middle Ages. But it measures about two feet tall by five and a half feet wide. It's hinged and wall-mounted. Thompson, like many artists of the era, was exploring strategies for moving beyond the flatness of a two-dimensional medium by emphasizing the objecthood of his paintings. While this is an impulse shared by many contemporaries, he's excavating the past for very specific examples, studying the narrative structures of Christian iconography and trying to find room to innovate within them. So you wouldn't have seen a triptych with painted hinges, but here he uses them to interject discontinuous slivers of landscape. With these biomorphic black tangles, he seems to explore ways of abstractly representing figurative energy. These masses read as manifestations of pure embodiment that seem to rupture the interdependence of figure and ground. As he said, quote, I'm interested in the relationships of the figure and the landscape, mass against movement. To me, presenting the forms are the most important thing, the way they work against one another with regard to space. To get a sense of just how much he experiments with technique and chromatic sensibility, here's a work in the show from the very next year. It has remained in a private collection since it was created. There's a strong suggestion of some body activity along the lines of the eschatological and scatological visions of Netherlandish artists like Hieronymus Bosch. Thompson emphasizes the coarseness of the subject by moving the paint around, building it up in places thickly and elsewhere scratching into it to reveal colors beneath. This overtone is picked up by critics, one of whom characterized his subjects broadly as, quote, events ritualized by oral tradition. For Red Cross, Thompson uses a piece of board and carves uncharacteristically deeply into it as though he's making a woodcut. His treatment of the support really evokes the materiality of the crucifix itself. This sense of amplification extends to the shape of the panel, an echo of the Red Cross depicted within. At center, a figure swings from an arm of the cross in an unconventional twist on a crucifixion or deposition. It's a pose that he uses elsewhere to disrupt traditional pastoral scenes. In place are many of the compositional pillars that he will develop over the next seven years. We look over the shoulder of two spectators in the foreground. Other bystanders include a rider on horseback and this ambiguous horse-dog creature. Christian passion iconography merges the experiences of beholding and peril, two themes that cut across his work. According to the artist, quote, painting should be like the theater, a presentation of something, some activity.
Thompson circulated in a downtown New York milieu. He lived and worked in a loft on Clinton Street initially, participated in some of the first happenings, multimedia performance events, and he frequented clubs like Slug Saloon and the Five Spot Cafe, where legendary performers, including Ornette Coleman and John Coltrane played. Bob met Carol Plenda from Detroit at the infamous Cedar Bar in 1959, and the two married in December 1960. He was always listening to and often playing music in the studio himself. Himself. According to his friend, jazz saxophonist Jackie McLean, the music was internal to the act of creation, and he describes the scene. Using large brushes, he would move back, look, move in, and splash color, move back again, look, then attach and lay on more color, always with music, his rhythm and the rhythm of the music seeming to move together. He worked fast and feverishly, almost as though he knew he had to accomplish a great deal in a short time. In the self-portrait at right, the drums eclipse the tools of his trade. He doesn't depict himself suspended at an easel, but seated, his gaze turned inward. We can see him bracing his body with one shoulder propped higher than the other, the daubs of green paint on his knuckles make the paintings around him an extension of himself. In a letter to one of his sisters, he described the profound impact of his move to New York City. I have found, let us say, another part of myself, which can only be for me. And this is, um, it's a work that uh, was in the show at Colby and in Chicago, um, but not here. Uh, so I wanted to just give you a sense of how capacious his visual inspirations are. He based figure with a red balloon on Le Ballon Rouge, a 1956 French film that I feel like I saw many times in elementary school <laughs> somehow. It was written and directed by Albert Lamaurice, and it's a nearly wordless film which follows a schoolboy and the balloon that he befriends across Paris. As an endeavor in visual storytelling, it's a tale of finding magic in one's surroundings. This is also a work that had been in the show um, with this many venues lenders are sometimes reluctant to part with things for the whole time, so um, this was uh, something we had to return. But I wanted to give you a sense of how withholding really seems to govern his aesthetic strategies. And this character, a protagonist, possibly an antagonist, depending on how you read things, this featureless silhouette under a hat is a symbol to which many associations continue to attach themselves. One 1960 Art News reviewer captured the hat's slippage between signature accessory and sinister uniform. Quote, a figure with a hat is seen from the rear. It is completely black, dropped into the landscape like a paper silhouette. It is a spectator. Perhaps it is Buster Keaton, or a huntsman, or a deputy sheriff, or the artist's suggestion, it is Lester Young, the jazz musician. And so just to give you a sense of the degree to which these can be kind of invisible, you'll often see along the, the edges of um, the work, but sometimes very sort of slyly um, elsewhere in a composition. The connection between this pork pie hat and jazz tenor saxophonist Lester Young was well-founded. Young, nicknamed Prez, died in 1959 at the age of 44, 
having made the hat practically metonymic. And I wanted to show a few drawings here from some of the clubs that Thompson frequented. His friend uh, Jackie McLean saw kinship in the ways that he and Thompson responded to the gritty realities of New York City. And he, he described their days saying, we continued our walks and studying the people's faces, now the derelicts on the Bowery. Bob expressed much of the anguish and despair of those faces in his work and I in my music. There were nights at slugs that I would play horrible sounds in my solos. I could see him responding and understanding that I was expressing what we had seen together early that afternoon. And so here you can see uh, one of his paintings. It's in the show on the wall of one of these clubs. According to Carol, Bob was involved in promoting Slug Saloon, a Lower East Side club that opened its doors in 1964. He designed their publicity materials, photographs show, his painting installed as a backdrop there. A different sunset every night, that's what jazz is about. So says saxophonist Sonny Rollins, who captures its sense of inexhaustible wonder. Thompson saw jazz as a space of Edenic possibility, a distinctly American music. It developed out of the ragtime and blues scenes in cities like New Orleans and blended aspects of Afro-diasporic and European traditions. This is Thompson's ode to the freedom found in music. By the time that he painted Garden of Music in 1960, free jazz, an even more experimental offshoot, had emerged. Archie Shepp, who composed a requiem for Thompson after his death, and is still around, recalls frequent walkouts by clubgoers who did not appreciate their radical sound. Garden of Music features some of the most influential jazz musicians of the moment, uh, only one of whom is around to confirm. But we have here Ornette Coleman with his vinyl sax, Don Cherry, the cornetist, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, on the drums, Ed Blackwell, and in the back, Charlie Hayden balancing his bass. There's a lot of speculation about other figures in the painting. I'm sure there'll be new speculation <laughs> from folks here. Thompson was also steeped in the intellectual life of New York. This is an unfinished portrait of Hetty and Leroy Jones, later Amiri Baraka, with the beginnings of something that might have represented their two children, Kelly and Lisa. And if you look closely, you'll see Kelly's name there. When the Joneses met Thompson, they were editing a literary journal and publishing the work of emerging New York School, Black Mountain, and Beat Poets. Hetty Jones later reflected on the way that her friend's work assumed the mantle of contemporary history painting, writing that what Bob had seen and painted was us. And this is a portrait of Allen Ginsberg from 1965, though he first met Thompson in 1958. Two years prior to that, Ginsburg had famously published Howl, a poem that became emblematic of 1950s countercultural movements. It opens, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. And what follows is a torrent of phrases elaborating on the condition of his contemporaries, who, for example, quote, howled on their knees in the subway and were dragged off the roof, waving genitals 
and manuscripts, and on and on. But many of Ginsburg's diagnostic verses echo Thompson's pictorial collisions between the mystical and the vulgar. In March 1961, Bob and his wife Carol sailed to Europe. They spent a month in London before moving on to Paris and then settling in Ibiza, Spain for over a year. Overseas, he was able to study the artworks he admired rather than contemplate them in reproduction. In a letter he writes to a Chicago gallerist shortly after he arrives in London, he describes his first visit to the National Gallery. I'm standing in front of Piero della Francesca shaking, uncontrollably so. Then Masaccio, Titians, Uccello, Rubens, Crivelli, Veronese. Piero again telling me, loving me, showing me that I've so much to do. This will make London for me, for the paintings in this place alone can bring, or should I say brought, a tear out of my eye that froze on my cheek halfway down and then burnt my chin. Later, when he gets to Paris, he writes that the contemporary art is atrocious, so he will be spending much of his time at the Louvre. Thompson claims that he gravitated to certain compositional genres more for their plastic properties than for their narrative, but the two are inextricably bound up in one another. And there are moments when his interventions into these compositions are undeniably pointed. According to the inscription on the reverse of the execution, he paints it in April 1961, just after he arrives in Paris. It's entirely possible he made this after seeing the original at the Louvre. It's one of nine panels depicting scenes from the lives of third century physicians, Cosmas and Damien. And there are um, the others, many others, that show failed attempts to take the lives of the two martyrs and their three brothers. But Thompson selects the scene in which they are finally executed. Like many 20th century artists, Thompson used the tree to slide between imagery associated with the Christian stations of the cross and scenes of social brutality. He secularizes religious violence and exposes the ritualistic nature of secular violence. Here he eclipses the horror of Fra Angelico's scene by adding a figure hanging from a tree. Is this the single execution of the title? The body does not quite swing from a noose. Instead, a white blindfold coils itself around a branch, suggesting, maybe, that the very personification of justice has been sacrificed. And this is just um, a shot from the installation at Colby. You have, in this show, the drawing on the right, but not the painting on the left. In addition to using religious imagery for its allegorical elasticity, Thompson intensified his study of legends and literature. Abstract and figurative expressionists alike mined myths for archetypes that could help assert their continuity with pre-modern societies. In the 1940s, Mark Rothko and other New York School painters professed interest in the ways that human values survive within these narratives. As Rothko expressed it, the myth holds us, therefore, not through its romantic flavor, not the remembrance of beauty of some bygone age, not through the possibilities of fantasy, but because it expresses to us something real and existing in ourselves, as it was to those who first stumbled upon the symbols to give them life. 
For Thompson, the interest seems to be zeroing in on the indivisible features of these narratives, expanding their allegorical breadth, drawing forward certain subtexts. Here you have two versions of paintings made based on the Christian legend of St. George. He responds in specific to an oil by the Venetian artist Tintoretto. The story of St. George and the Dragon is told in the Golden Legend, a collection of the lives of saints. George slayed a dragon who had been terrorizing a village and rescued the princess who was about to be sacrificed in appeasement. In Thompson's hands, this dramatic encounter is tightened through the triangulation of the axe-wielding rider, the bloodthirsty dragon, and the woman. And because the creature has not yet been struck, the scene is one of heightened tension. And just briefly, here's another work that he makes after Titian's rendition of the myth of Perseus and Andromeda. It's possibly the case that he saw the Titian on the right in London in 1961. And I just wanted to give some sense of how much work there is, but how many variations on a subject there, um, there are. And so here you see two other uh, finished versions on top, and then on the bottom a snapshot that Carol Thompson had taken of a, an unlocated painting. Um, you can see the difference there in terms of the red sky and the arc of the dragon's back so that it breaks the horizon in a very different way. Bob and Carol spent over a year in Ibiza, first in the old town and then on a farm where they cared for a donkey uh, who is not in any of these photos but is in the scrapbook. Fellow artist Bill Burrell described the Thompson's cratered cave dwelling in the old town as follows. His place was just like his paintings in a way, the hallways, the dark areas, the holes in the wall. And I think many of his aesthetic commitments really reach their fullest expression once he immerses himself in the work of the 18th century Spanish artist Francisco de Goya. Goya, who built his reputation as a court portraitist but issued harsh critiques from within its midst developed a fantastic formal language to scaffold his ideation. His prowess as a social observer and printmaker reveals itself in Los Caprichos, a collection of 80 prints published in 1799. Broadly speaking, Los Caprichos functions as a compendium of human immorality in which Goya encoded targets of his satire, the clergy, the nobility, the educational and penal systems in moralizing images accompanied by pithy captions. The circus riffs on the sleep of reason produces monsters, perhaps Goya's most renowned self-referential allegory. Goya's artist slumbers at his desk, orbited by a menagerie of wide-eyed nocturnal creatures including owls, bats, and a lynx. The print has been interpreted um, a lot, but as a distillation of the artist's project, an examination of the agon between reason and fantasy. Whereas Goya's nocturnal stirrings confine themselves to the space of dreams in something of a peaceable coexistence, Thompson's birds clash with two figures, alter egos, as though the artist's plight is to wrestle with, or perhaps even harness, irrationality. And here's another example of a painting after one of the caprichos. 
that gives you, I think, a better sense of how malleable these were for Thompson and how much the injection of color working from these prints enhances his disfiguration. The Thompsons returned to the Lower East Side of New York in 1963, and Bob began to enjoy greater commercial success. The French painter Nicolas Poussin emerged as another tributary, particularly in 1964 and 1965. The pillars of Poussin's classicism were antiquity and nature. And this timing coincided with commemorations of the 300th anniversary of Poussin's death. He's the only painter to appear by name in Thompson's single surviving artist statement, where he says, and about which composition I don't know, I have interpreted this composition as I see it and feel it, just as Poussin might have done with the same scene, the subject being the same, but the interpretation different. Here he celebrates the musician and civil rights activist Nina Simone, with whom he socialized in Provincetown during the summer of 1965. He bases the composition on the Bacchanal with a lute player, and it's an electric take on a, a familiar genre. The pastoral idealizes rural life, placing sensuous emphasis on humankind's relationship to the natural world. He has transposed the blue gown of the guitar player onto the inky skin of the figure. Simone is distinguished by a red flecked mauve color and is given an especially commanding stance. A classically trained singer-songwriter who was known for blending musical styles, she had deepened her politicization in keeping with her belief that an artist's duty is to reflect the times. On their second trip overseas, beginning in November 1965, Bob and Carol settled in Rome, where on May 30th, 1966, he died of a pulmonary edema. He had experienced a series of complications following appendicitis and gallbladder surgery. Years of drug and alcohol use invariably contributed to his health issues. Carol wasn't with her husband when he died. She had traveled to Greece to find their next rental. But when she returned, she wrote letters, some of which I found, to her husband's galleries, pleading for financial assistance so she could bring his body home. In New York, a memorial service was held on June 12th at Judson Memorial Church with a benefit concert at Slugs to follow. Ads in the newspaper announced that the money collected will be sent to Thompson's widow. But in the final months of his life in Rome, he seems to have visited Arezzo to see the Piera della, Francesco, della Francesca frescoes that he had long dreamed of. To approximate the weathering of the pigments on the walls of the basilica, he used colored pencil, crayons, and pastel. His friend, the painter Anne Tabachnik, visited him and described these large, quite large drawings tacked up all over the studio. She thought they looked a little bit like he did at the time. Quote, a little unstable on his feet, lean, a little drawn, a little tentative. The poet A.B. Spellman wrote a poem called The Beautiful Day, number 10. We've published it for the first time in the exhibition catalog. In it, he alludes to this cycle of works. And just a snippet. Piero's Sheba freezes in adoration of the holy wood while Bob's bird with the man's face hovers over her 
like the roof of a tent. And as he reflects in the exhibition catalog, quote, this was written on the occasion of Bob's much, much too early death. I might have read it at the funeral, but as the old tag says about the 60s, if you remember them, you weren't there. Procession is a light motif that winds its way through Thompson's oeuvre. Visually, it can meander in and out of abstraction. Conceptually, the procession posits movement as ephemeral space or sight. It bridges the sacred, the profane, the historical, the contemporary. Here you have a 1961 procession at an aqueduct and a 1963 procession, both in the show. Compositions like these carry many other pictorial traces within them. For starters, I think of Gustave Courbet's Berriolet Ornant, a 19th century manifesto of social realism that Thompson could quite possibly have seen at the Louvre before it was transferred to the Orsay. Leroy Jones even entitled the suite of poems that he wrote for Thompson, The Parade. Here, Thompson brings ceremonial energy into the present. He has photostatically enlarged what appears to be a found image, and he has painted directly over it. The sheet is then mounted onto a masonite panel, but exposed passages of black and white reveal traces of text, indicating that this is the side of an American Airlines plane. And so you'll see it there, but then all these other moments where the black and white comes through. As in Garden of Music, these bodies have some physical specificity. Stairway to the Stars shares a title with a jazz standard about the levitational sublimity of love. But Thompson's all too human looking characters descend earthbound. I recently re-encountered this 1965 painting by Norman Lewis, Processional, a generation older than Thompson. Lewis came of age during the Harlem Renaissance and his career married abstraction to social justice. Lewis shared a preoccupation with masses of people in motion, a subject that bore positive and negative connotations, carnival, and the Ku Klux Klan. This is one of his evocations of the Selma to Montgomery marches led by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in 1965. One compositional and thematic through line of Thompson's work seems to be the nature, the texture, of collectivity. I've been reflecting on the resonance one sees with other pictorial registers from the civil rights era. These three photographs document the plight of the Little Rock Nine, a group of black teenagers who challenged segregation at Little Rock's Central High School in 1957. When these students showed up on the second day of the school year, having been told not to on the first, they were met by violent racist mobs and the Arkansas National Guard, who had been deployed by their governor. Eventually, President Eisenhower issued an executive order dispatching a US Army unit to impose order. For a Louisville College student like Thompson, this event would have presented regional, personal immediacy. Looking at many, and there are many of these photographs, I'm struck by the ways that they pictorialize the fragmentation of these factions. 
the social breakage on which white supremacy feeds and which it seeks to advance is palpable in ways that call to mind the dramatic parallelism and disjunction in some of Thompson's oils. To close, I want to just allude to the artist's many afterlives. British artist Frank Bowling, born in Guyana in 1934, had this to say about Bob Thompson in 1969. Well, it's a little long, but it's good. The works have a sneaky look, a feel, stamp, and finally a quality about them. One might say, this painting reminds me of that Piero. Which one is it? The nativity? But then one looks hard, and it doesn't at all. What we thought was Piero disappears, and we have a Thompson, a rich, sumptuous, and undeniably complex painting generating its own personal heat, comparable only to a Picasso's use of tribal sculpture or a Van Gogh's use of Japanese prints. We had to wait for a Bob Thompson to understand more clearly. He remains an ever renewing touchstone. So on the left, you see a painting I spotted on Instagram during the pandemic. It was a great time to spy on artists. And it was one of the reasons that I recruited the Los Angeles-based artist Henry Taylor for the catalog. Taylor came to painting late in life. He writes of discovering Thompson, but also feeling like he was always there. This makes you want to be a better painter, Thompson, but Taylor contends in the catalog. And I've also thrown in a studio still life by the artist Hilary Petchis, also based in Los Angeles. And you can just make out the Whitney Bob Thompson catalog, standing in for his centrality to her thoughts on color. So I want to conclude with this photo of an incomplete painting that was in his studio when he departed for Europe in 1961. He was famous for leaving work behind wherever he went. In this case, he invited the artist Rosalind Drexler to help herself to any of his materials. So she restretched the canvas and painted on the other side. This specter remains behind her finished painting on loan to the Whitney Museum of American Art. Just as Bob Thompson saw himself carrying on the unfinished business of artists who came before, he seemed to invite the same from those who followed a procession. Thank you very much. And I have no timekeeper, but I think we have time for a few questions. I can be your timekeeper. Does anybody have a question? Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's been a long time. I was going to start with a joke about Zoom, but I, I, I scratched it. So thank you. I'm curious. I'm curious what you know about his personal faith and if how much of this was intellectual and, and what if there was a spiritual resonance in using all these old Renaissance religious yeah. Aspects. In that's I get that question a lot. Um, you know, I, th I think I always start by saying, in general, there's just not, and I think this is the case so often, there's not a lot that remains of, of him. Um, of, there's one extended interview that he gives. There's one artist statement. There are a few applications for grants. He does win um, two grants that help support his time in Europe. Um, and in one of the interviews, you get the sense that he's very self-consciously 
again, kind of telling you some things but not others. So he makes a point of saying that he does not, he's not found a religion that means something to him. So even though I understand him to have been raised in a church-going household, it wasn't something that he felt um, was a part of his life. And, you know, I think he was very, he was also very reticent to be construed as an intellectual for whatever reason. So sometimes he'd get into conversations with friends and, you know, they'd say, and he would say something like, like you just, you, I, I'm, no, I'm no intellectual, but was a voracious reader and a poet. I think that letter about the encounter with works of art really, and, and many of the things he wrote in his journal, he is an incredible intellectual, but the spiritual piece is much harder to see anywhere, but I think in the artwork. Yeah, yeah, I mean, is that, that may be the spiritual, <laughs> presence for him there. Other questions? Thank you so much. Well, you're so welcome. And Thank Michael you. will answer all your questions for the next three months. So enjoy the show yeah, and come, thank come you all so much. Come back to see the show. What? People, you People need to see the show. show. And yeah. there is one more stop. So if you have friends in Los Angeles, the exhibition will be there um, from October to January as well. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, uh, the Hammer Museum. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.